quick video for you to help you get ready for test one. So I'm going to highlight some of the main things that we looked at in chapter two. So if we take a look at this problem, you notice it's an equation. It has fractions. So the first thing we're going to do is look at our denominators, which are three and four. And since three times four is 12, if we multiply everything by 12, everything not in parentheses, it will get rid of both fractions. So we're going to do 12 times and then equals 12 times times three. Okay, and then from here, remember when you multiply, you're gonna multiply the 12 by the top of the fraction and divide by the, what's on the bottom. So 12 times two is 24. When we put 24 over three, that gives us eight times five x minus four. On this side, 12 times one is 12. Putting that over four gives us back three x and then 12 times comfortable solving compared to what we had initially up here and it took just one line of work to get there so if we distribute 8 times 5 and 8 times negative 4 we're gonna get is equal to 3x plus 36 you notice on this side I have three terms whenever there are three terms in a linear problem that means two of them will combine if not all three but in this case the negative 32 and 12 will combine we use the signs that are there, not changing it because we're not moving it to the other side. So negative 32 plus 12 gave me that negative 20. And then I have 3, so I'm going to subtract 3x from both sides. And I get 36. If I add 20 to both sides, and dividing by 37, we have x is equal to need to do is check to see if it reduces however 37 is a prime number and it doesn't go into 56 so we are definitely good with our solution we have a 7 a 3 and a 2 so 7 times 3 times 2 will give me 42 so 42 is our magic number that will get rid of all the fractions so we're going to put a 42 in front of every term I'm literally just rewriting the original problem in brackets if we take a look from here, we're going to do 42 times the top on each of them. So 42 times 2 would give me 84. And when I put 84 over 7, it gives me back 12. So I have 12x. 42 times 1 is... And on this side, 42 times 5 is going to give me 105. 42 times 5 is 210 to 14 to both sides. I have 12x is equal to, one, I have x is equal to 119 over six, which is two and three. So the only factors that actually go into 12 are either two or three. And two doesn't go into 119. If you did the digit sum, it's 11. So three doesn't go into 119. And therefore nothing will go into both 12 and 119. So that's our answer in here just to keep it fun first thing I'm going to do is distribute to get rid of all the parentheses since I don't have any fractions to get rid of so 5x is equal to 6 minus 8x and again I'm just double checking myself to make sure I have the right numbers we're all good to go so then from here again there's more than two terms on each side which means I can definitely combine so if I look here I have an x and an x which will combine same thing on this side, an x and an x will combine. And then on each side, I also have constants that will combine. So the parts that we highlight here will all go together. And again, we're not moving anything from one side to the other. So we don't need to do the opposite operation. We use the signs that are there in the problem. So 5x minus 7x will give me negative 2x. Negative 21 plus 9 should give me negative 12. And if we move to the right-hand side, I have a negative 8x and a 6x, which would be negative 2x. And then a 6 minus 12 should give me a negative 6. From here, I'm going to move the variable first. So if I add 2x to both sides, you notice that the variable completely cancels here, leaving us with negative 12 on the left. And it completely cancels on the right, leaving us with negative 6. And that looks weird because it's missing a variable. And negative 12 definitely does not equal negative 6. Therefore, there is no solution that will make that equation true. So our answer is simply no solution. If you were to be asked what type of equation this is, it's called a contradiction. All right, so then if we take a look at some word problems, 
We're going to do one of those now. When we look at this one, we have a student needing to earn an average of 87.5 on the remaining 240 points. So this is the total amount that they need, percent out of the total points. And then we have the class broken up into two categories, which are quizzes and tests. So if we take a look, he has 80% on quizzes. And then we have, let's do another color, 92% on the remaining tests. So how many points must each category be worth for him to pass? Now, you notice that there is a total of 240 points. We said that there's 240 points remaining right here. And in that 240 points, we're going to have them split into the 80%, which is the quiz category. And then we have the test category, which he got 92% on. But we need to know how many points are going to be in each of those categories. So if we call this amount x, the second one is just going to be 240 minus x. Just like if we were going to invest money. If we had $10,000 to invest and we don't know how much to put in each account, we would put x in the first amount and then 10,000 minus x in the second account. So now when I write this out, I'm going to write it like this. We're going to do, I'm trying to color coordinate here. So I have quiz, points, and then we're going to do, oops, plus, oh my goodness, plus, I'll put my equal sign already so I don't have to switch colors again. And then I have test points, and then total, it has to add up to my total points. And I'm doing that just so you can try to see how things work together. So when I look through this, if I get ready to answer it for the quiz, quizzes are worth 80%, or he, excuse me, he earned 80% on the quizzes. And we don't know how many points the quizzes were worth total. So he got 80% on them, but we don't know how many points were directed towards quizzes. And then if we look at test, he got a 92% on the test, but we have 240 minus X for the number of points that the test were worth. And then for our total, he has an average of 84%, oops, not 84. 87.5%, sorry, just read that wrong. So 0.875, and we know that the total number of points was 240. So in other words, this is similar to the interest rate because interest rate was principal times rate times time. Well, for our points, we have the rate, meaning the grade, times the number of points. And then there's not really a time here. You could assume like we are saying time is one, but the formula works very similarly. So if we go ahead and distribute this out, we have 0.8x plus 0.92 times 240 is going to come out to, let's see here, 8 times 240. I don't know if I trust myself to do it in my head. So if we do it here, 0.8 times, no, it's 0 0.92. 0 0.92 times 240, 220.8. All right, let's go back. 220.8 minus 0.92x is equal to, on the right-hand side, let's do that one, 0.875 times 240. I get 210. So 210. All right, and now from here, again, we have more than two terms on the left, so we can combine. When I combine these two, 0.8 minus 0.92 is negative 0.12x plus 220.8 is equal to 210. So from here, we would subtract our 220.8 and subtract 220.8. So I have negative 0.12x is equal to, if I subtract those two numbers, it should just give me negative 10.8. All right, and then we're going to divide by negative 0.12 and divide by negative 0.12. So I get x is equal to, and I'm pretty sure 108 divided by 12 is going to be 9. So we will get 90 as our answer here. All right, and again, the negative over negative makes that a positive 
So I found X, but what did X stand for? So if we go back up to the top where we highlighted here on the side, X stood for the amount of points that he earned on the quizzes. And then to find our amount of points that the tests were worth, then we have to do 240 minus 90. So we're going to answer the question fully now. So quizzes worth 90 points and the test was worth, if I do 240 minus 90, I get 150 points. And by the way, if you wanted to check this to see if it worked, if you know about a weighted average, if you actually added up 0.8 times 90 and then uh, 0.92 times 150, it would come out to 210 points, which is how many points he earned by getting 87.5% on the remaining 240 points that were available. This is something you definitely want to practice, by the way. All six of these slides are things that you're going to see appearing on your test. All right, so if we look at this one, I gave you an inequality. And again, I'm pushing the idea that you practice these fractions. So if we notice, we have denominators of 9, 2, and 2. So you could use the number 36 by doing 9 times 2 times 2. But I don't really need to multiply the 2 twice, because if I use it once, it's going to take care of both of them. So I'm just going to use 18. So 9 times 2 is telling me to use 18. Again, if you use 36, it would work. You would just have bigger numbers in the problem. So we're going to do, and then I write 36 because I said that. We're going to use 18 in front of each term. So 5 ninths x minus 18 times 1 half is less than or equal to 18 times 7 over 2. All right, and again, this is one of those benefits of having the negative sign assumed to be in the top of the fraction because then you're not dividing or multiplying by a negative, causing you to have to flip your inequality. When we multiply it through, remember it's going to get multiplied by the top. So 18 times 5 is 90, and 90 over 9 is simply just 10. So that's 10x. When we do the second one, 18 times 1 is 18. Divided by 2 gives me back 9. And then I have is less than or equal to, all right, 18 times 7. So 10 times 7 is 70. 8 times 7 is 56. So 70 and 56 is 126. And then 126 divided by 2. 126 divided by 2 should give me 63. And again, I could have done it the other way. I could have said 18 and 2 become just 9. 9 times 7 is still 63. So it works either way. All right, and then from here, we're going to add 9. So I have 10x is less than or equal to 72. I'll divide by 10. Notice I don't need to flip anything because I divided by a positive 10. So x is less than or equal to. But then we can reduce this. 72 divided by 10, 2 goes into both since they're even. So that would be 36 over 5. And then that does not reduce any further. So this is our answer. And then we're asked to graph the solution. So I'm going to put 36 over 5. Well, if I divided 36 by 5, 35 divided by 5 would be 7. So that's 7 and 1 fifth or 7.2, which means that 7 is pretty close here and 8 would be over there. Again, it doesn't have to be perfectly spaced, just as long as you're between the right numbers. And then we have to look at our symbol. So when we look at the original problem, you can see here and right here in our answer that it does have the bar both times. So it means that it's going to be a closed circle. And when I read from the variable, it says x is less than. So less than is going to go to the left. So that's my uh, graph that they asked for. And the last thing that they asked for is interval notation. And so when we look at this, we're looking at the ray that we just drew in green. And if we look, that ray goes all the way to the left. We can't actually equal it, so we use a parenthesis for negative infinity. And on the right-hand side, it stops at the number 36 over 5. And that side gets a bracket because it does actually equal it. So this is our answer in the interval notation. All right, one last one. So this one is an absolute value. 
And when we do absolute value, we have two kinds. We have and and or. So remember, and are the kind that come together like this. And so we don't usually put the arrows because it really just makes one. So what ends up happening is you get a segment like such. And that can have open or closed circles. In or statement, the arrows typically go away from each other like this. And so that's the way that we're going to see it on a graph. Whether they're open circles or closed circles, again, depends on the problem. So when we look at this one, it says the absolute value is greater than 10. Well, if we think about absolute value, absolute value says a number's distance from zero. So if it's greater than 10, that means that it's far away in this direction or far away in that direction, and that's an or statement. So we're going to write it as an or statement. 7x minus 4 is greater than 10, or... And just like with the equations, you remember the first time you write it, all you do is drop the bars, and we write the word or. And the second time I write it, I'm going to write 7x minus 4. But instead of 10, I have to negate, meaning multiply by a negative. And if I multiply by a negative, that symbol also flips. And now I can solve each of the inequalities that we've just drawn. So if we solve this one, oh, I have Christmas colors already. 7x is greater than 14, and if we divide by 2, x is greater than 7. Make sure, yeah, x is greater than 7. That seems like I'm making a mistake because I'm doing this quickly and I looked at it like I was crazy. So 14 divided by 2 is 7, or I have the word or. When we solve this side, I have 7x is less than negative 6. And then if we divide by 7, x is less than negative 6 over 7. So that's our answer. Okay, but then we're going to graph it, and we're also going to write it in interval notation. So we need to have negative 6 sevenths for sure. That would obviously be on that side, and 7 would be over here. And then if we look at our graph, let's continue that out a little bit. Negative 6 sevenths is not quite negative 1, so I can put negative 1 there, and then 8 would be over here. Again, the spacing doesn't have to be perfect, but I do need to make sure that I have my correct symbols. So if we looked at the original problem, the original problem did not have the bar underneath, so that means it's open circle for both of them. On your absolute values, they're going to be the same in, for both. And then from there, we have to draw our arrows. So the first one says x is greater than 7, going this way. And the second one, x is less than negative 6 sevenths. And it did make that or statement like we talked about up here when we first began with our lines going apart from each other, our rays. So the last thing I need to do is write in interval notation. Now you notice that this time I have two different pieces. It's not one continuous piece. If I wanted to draw the two blue rays that I drew, I have to pick my pencil up. So we're going to look at the left one first, and then we'll look at the right one. So when we look at this left one, this is the part I'm referring to that I just highlighted. That arrow goes all the way to the left to negative infinity, which we cannot equal, so we use a parenthesis. And that piece stops at negative 6 sevenths. And again, it gets a parenthesis because we cannot equal it since it's an open circle and the bar was not included in the inequality. Then I put a U that stands for union. And now I'm going to look over here at this piece on the right side. And that one starts at 7. We use the parenthesis because it wasn't a closed circle, same reason. And then it goes all the way to the right to infinity, and it gets another parenthesis. So then this is our answer in interval notation. And hopefully then this video helps you to prepare a little bit more as you're getting ready to take your tests.